Today's show is brought to you by BipSync, the research management software for modern investors. BipSync works to define and accelerate your approach to manager selection, diligence, oversight, and analysis in one integrated research platform. They count as clients some of the largest fund of funds, endowments, foundations, pensions, and family offices, including some of the most prestigious past guests on the show. Think of BipSync as the operating system for all your research needs, supporting and enabling your investment process. Visit BipSync.com to book a demo and see what a modern cloud-based research solution can do for you. Today's show is also brought to you by Janus Henderson Investors. In an environment where allocators face more questions than answers, having a trusted partner is critical. Janice Henderson Investors is committed to building partnerships with institutional investors based on collaboration, insights, and transparency. With 26 offices and 350 investment professionals worldwide, Janice Henderson has the scale to offer a global perspective across equities, fixed income, and alternatives, and the depth to offer local expertise and support for clients. To learn more about partnering with Janice Henderson, visit JaniceHenderson.com slash institutional. Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting CapitalAllocators.com. My guest on today's show is Richard Tedlow, the class of 1949 Professor of Business Administration Emeritus at the Harvard Business School, where he spent three decades teaching business history. Richard left HBS in 2010 to join the faculty of Apple University, and he retired in 2018. Earlier this year, he published The Emergence of Charismatic Business Leadership, which is the subject of the show. Our conversation covers Richard's background and lessons learned teaching for four decades. We then turned to his latest tome, discussing the American history of business leaders without charisma, transitional period introducing charisma, and the modern era of superstar CEOs. Along the way, we discussed the definition, traits, downside, and future of charismatic business leadership. Please enjoy my conversation with Richard Tedlow. Richard, it is wonderful to see you, and I want to thank you for doing this. Well, the feeling is mutual, and thank you very much for having me on board. Why don't you take me back? I'm kind of curious how someone becomes a longstanding business history professor. What happened was when I was five years old, 69 years ago, my mother bought me a book called History Can Be Fun, and I still have the book, and it's true. History turned out to be fun, and I became interested in business history because my father was a business executive, and I was always curious about what exactly he did when he got up in the morning and went to work. It was that simple. And it was, I was very much of a destination shopper. Once I found this home for my intellectual ambitions, I really didn't want to do anything else. So did you ever have thoughts of being in the business world? I discussed it briefly with my father. This is when he said the line, it's very cold out there. He also said, hammer, strike, anvil, bear, which I took to mean that it's very important to know the difference about whether you are the hammer or the anvil. And most people in business are the anvil. And when you're the anvil, you've got to take a lot of punishment. And since he was, I think, a protective man, he wanted me to find a safe haven. And that was not in the business world. So to be honest with you, Ted, I don't think I would have been a successful business executive. I don't think that's who I am. This fits me like a glove, and I'm very comfortable having spent my life doing this. So in a broad brush over multiple decades, I guess, at Harvard Business School before going to Apple U, what did you choose to study, right? The idea of business history, I suppose, is a big one. It is a big one. There were two things. 
First, there's the survey. What's the master narrative of business history in the United States? And that was provided by one of my two wonderful mentors, a man named Alfred D. Chandler, Jr. And the master narrative was the coming of management. Prior to 1840, approximately, in the United States, it was a nation of small businesses. Owners knew other owners, workers knew other workers, owners knew workers, and there was perfect information. Basically, it was the world of neoclassical economics. And when the railroad revolution took place, beginning in the late 1840s and very strongly in the 1850s, that's when you began to get managerial hierarchies. With that came a whole host of issues such as agency problems and all the rest of it. That's the master narrative of business history. That story, the story of the coming of management, of people who who made major decisions with regard to allocating resources, but who had a very small percentage of equity in the corporation. Then how did the labor movement in the early 20th century respond to the coming of big business, managerial enterprise to the United States? And how did the government respond? And that was the course that I taught. My own personal interests have always tended toward biography. So 20 years ago, I wrote a book called Giants of Enterprise, which was essentially a biographical sketches of, of seven business executives. And that's because I enjoy finding out the conflicts these people dealt with, their thrusts and their parries, and the battle of business. And I've always found that a very interesting story. You mentioned the idea of master narrative, and I'm curious... When you've gone to teach, is there some master narrative in your head that you're trying to impart on your students? There's an old saying that planning is vital and plans are useless. In the Harvard Business School classroom, that is the truth. I don't think there's anybody in the history of the school who ever planned a class more carefully than I did. And when I walked in there, I tried to throw the plans away and just let things happen get the students to interact in ways that I wasn't expecting and that they weren't expecting. Because when that happens, two very important things take place. One is I'm a firm believer in participant-centered learning, by which I mean that you, Ted Sides, are more likely to be impacted and to remember something that you figured out yourself than something that somebody else has told you. So that's one thing. And the other is you never really know how students are going to interact with one another. And you want to let that happen in real time. And if that happens, they're not going to fall asleep on you. So I guess one of my major goals was to keep the students awake. (laughs) So after so much time in that very special environment, what was it that led you to leave and move on to Apple University? Well, part of it, frankly, was personal. My late beloved first wife died of ovarian cancer. I was fortunate enough to get a second chance. I I remarried a number of years thereafter. And it just, it seemed to me that with the remarriage, it was time for a change. I certainly didn't want to live in the house that I had lived in with my first wife, with my second wife. You know, it didn't make any sense. Then Apple came along out of the blue and said, you know, we're starting something called Apple University. Why don't you come out and interview? And they were willing to pay for the flight. So you know, I didn't want the job because when you're tenured at Harvard, you can't be fired no matter how dumb you are. So, <laughs> And in a business, it's not that way. If you don't perform, they get rid of you. I mean, it's like horrifying. So I went out and I had a set of interviews that I will never forget. The first interview was with someone who told me all about his house on Lake Tahoe. And so, okay, you have more money than I do. Okay, next. So the next interviewer came in and told me all about her house on Lake Tahoe. And it was kind of the same thing. So, But they paid for it, and I was perfectly happy. The third interviewer was Tim Cook. He didn't say that. He came in and said nothing. And it was very intriguing that he was comfortable with silence. And so I was looking at him, and I was figuring, you know, he's the chief operating officer at the time. This was 2010. Steve Jobs was still alive. And I thought to myself, they must be paying this man an awful lot of money. Why don't I ask him a question? So I asked him, I think, a very good business school question. He was a Fuqua scholar at Duke's business school. He gave me a very good business school answer. He said, can I ask you a question? 
And I said, yeah, we can make this a regular conversation. Then after him, I met Johnny Ive, Ron Johnson, who started the stores. And I was really smitten by the idea of starting a new, a new marriage and a new set of challenges. And so that's how that happened. What did you find over your years there? It was fascinating. First of all, I found that unlike the tenured professoriate at a university, if you didn't deliver, you were out. And it was that simple. Secondly, the company during the period that I was there, 2010 to 2018, was exploding. So it was fascinating to be with a company that was growing so fast and trying so much to create the future. And thirdly, I, I was there on October 5th, 2011, which is a day I will never forget. That's the day Steve Jobs died. The whole world took notice. And that, by the way, was the stimulus for the writing of this book. Although I wasn't going to write one while I was at Apple because I had a job and I was busy. But when I retired in 2018, I thought, you know, I ought to go back to this because there has never been in American history a reaction to the death of a CEO the way the country and indeed the whole world reacted to the death of Steve Jobs. I mean, there were people, uh, Ted, you may remember this if you were walking past an Apple store, who bought bouquets of flowers and put them in front of Apple stores. This had never happened before. And this was so remarkable. Being an historian, I've read histories of funerals of business executives going all the way back to the early 19th century. Believe me, this was unique. And so the question in my mind was, why did this happen? And the answer that I came up with was that Steve Jobs was a charismatic individual, and that's how this book took place. So I want to dive into the book about charisma in business leaders. And I suppose it makes sense to start, as you did in the book, talking about what the definition of charisma is. Well, first of all, the definition of charisma is very difficult. There have, in fact, been books written about this. Max Weber, this famous, one of the founders of sociology, German, brought it into common parlance. If you look at the dictionary, it defines charisma as compelling attractiveness or charm that can inspire devotion in others. That's a direct quote. Elon Musk, who I think, or the last time I looked, Ted, was personally worth more than ExxonMobil. I think he had $230 billion dollars. This is strictly confidential, but that's more money than I have. So Musk has been described in a very good biography of him as a man who managed to sell the world on his capacity to achieve objectives so lofty that from the mouth of anyone else, they'd be called fantasies. The charismatic business leader, from an historian's way of putting it, this is the person, a man or woman, who stands at the edge of history and brings the future to the present. Through a mixture of charm and guile and brilliance and sometimes cruelty, he or she remakes the industry and in some cases society. You will do things for a charismatic leader that you will not do for somebody who isn't charismatic. And that's about as I'm kind of surrounding the definition. It's like trying to nail mercury to the wall. It's very hard to do, but this is about as good as I can manage. You said charm, guile, brilliance, and cruelty. What aspect of cruelty comes to charismatic leaders? They feel that their mission is so important. We're saving the world. We're transforming the automobile. We're landing on Mars. I mean, you name it, that they have the right to be cruel to people who are not performing to the specs that they think they deserve. They feel that their goals are so lofty and that they themselves are so vital to the future of the human race. My mother used to talk about people who loved the human race but hated every individual. There's a certain truth there that I don't have to care about you. You're getting in my way, and my way is to reinvent something that needs to be reinvented or to land on Mars, which is what Musk talks about, that sort of thing. You hear charismatic people described in a lot of ways but you rarely see the word nice associated with them. And that's one reason why. They can be cruel. So there's so much to pull apart in some of those definitions. Maybe we circle back a little bit and go through your book because the idea of an Elon Musk or a Steve Jobs leading companies hasn't always been this way. 
So take me back to where this all comes from and how it evolved. You couldn't be more right. History is the study of change over time. And there has been a major change in the nature of the American CEO from the post-World War II period to what we see today. So let me take you back to World War II for just a second. Everybody in the United States in 1945 knew who Adolf Hitler was. Everybody hated him. But nobody doubted that Hitler was a charismatic man. And so in, to some degree, Hitler gave charisma a bad name, if you will. And if you look at the American presidents, I mean, the president of the United States when I was born was Harry Truman. Dwight D. Eisenhower followed him. These people, I mean, they were almost grandfatherly. And in businesses, you didn't see charisma because you need charisma if there's going to be innovation. You need charisma to drive change. And in the 1950s, the United States was a global hegemon. Right after the war, we had exclusive possession of atomic weaponry. We had a gigantic army, a gigantic navy. And moreover, if you look at the signature product of the 20th century, that's the automobile. Just as the signature product of the 21st century, I would say, is the computer. And in 1950, 85% of the automobiles manufactured in the whole world were produced in the United States. So we were really not only a military, but an economic hegemon. As a leader, we actually didn't want change. We thought that history stopped with our success. There was a book written after World War II, which I, if I were you, would put on my must-miss list called God is My Co-Pilot. That's how people were thinking. We thought that history stopped because we were on top and we were good. It turned out that history didn't stop with that. But that was, if you looked at the CEOs at the time, the company of companies in the industry of industries in the 1950s was General Motors. General Motors had over half the automobile market in the United States in 1955, and uh, imports accounted for only 0.71%. And that's why the CEO of General Motors in 1955 was chosen as Time Magazine's Man of the Year. His name is one that none of your listeners have heard of. It's Harlow Curtis. Now, very few people at the time knew who he was, unless you were in the auto industry. These were not people, people like Curtis, who it's interesting as 1955, being Time Magazine's Man of the Year was something, today means nothing. That was also when the Fortune 500 was founded, and GM was the linchpin of the Detroit-Pittsburgh economy around which the United States revolved. And he was chosen not because of the man he was, although I assume he was a fine fellow. I mean, there's been no biography written of him, but because of the job he had. The job had a man rather than the man having a job. That has changed. In 1955, also happens to be the year Steve Jobs was born. And I find that piquant because it's as unimaginable that Jobs would have run the General Motors of 1955 as it is that Harlow Curtis would have run Apple in 2007, which is the year the iPhone was introduced. So, yeah, there's been a big change. Today, the CEO is often the face of the corporation. It's Jeff Bezos, Steve Jobs, it's Elon Musk, it's Oprah Winfrey, you name it. Then that wasn't true. The CEO tended to be quite anonymous. How did we get from there to here? We got from there to here for a couple of reasons. I tried to lay out three phases. The first phase is basically the age of administration, where the CEO is the chief mechanic of the corporation. And his or her job, although in those days was almost always him, his job was to keep the company running and to keep it with half of the U.S. auto market. By the 1970s, I choose the year 1975 almost randomly. It was after the first oil shock. It was the year we lost the Vietnam War. By the 1970s, I'll put it this way, the swinging 60s had morphed into the sobering 70s. The United States was no longer hegemonic. Japan and Germany had come back. They had products on, on global markets, very successful products. Toyota had come up with a new way of producing automobiles which eventually conquered what the Japanese called the automobile kingdom, which was the United States. And so we were no longer on top. Our governmental system was in disarray. 
We had Nixon forced from office in 1974, Gerald Ford, who was the only president who was not actually elected. He was appointed vice president and then became president when Nixon was ejected. And as he said, I am a Ford, not a Lincoln. Well, that's not a charismatic statement. And then Jimmy Carter was his successor, a very fine man in my opinion, but not a terribly successful president. And in his Malay's speech, Carter said, people have accused me not of leading the nation, but of managing the government. That's the very essence. One of the things when you study charisma is you learn what it isn't, and that's what it isn't. I'm not leading, this is what Carter, these are his words. I'm not leading the nation, I'm managing the government. And at the same time, you begin to see charismatic business leaders. So although no one, my guess is, who's listening to this has heard of Harlow Curtis, my guess is a lot of people have heard of Lee Iacocca. Lee Iacocca became famous for turning around Chrysler, which was on the verge of bankruptcy in 1979, and actually went bankrupt in 2009, as did General Motors. And he also became famous because of these commercials that he ran. These commercials were very in-your-face. They were very hard sell. And he ended them with a tagline, if you can find a better car, buy one. And he became the face of Chrysler. He was more important than Walter Chrysler himself. I mean, he became Chrysler. That was new. You see a couple of other executives, Mary Kay Ash, who founds Mary Kay, who says that to me, P&L isn't profit and loss, it's people and love. And she said, I try to imagine everyone that I encounter with a sign that says, make me feel important. And she started this company on a shoestring. Her husband was going to be the profit and loss part of P&L. He died of a heart attack at breakfast a month before the company was supposed to launch. It launched, it was successful. She came to the Harvard Business School. And let me tell you something, this woman had the students in the palm of her hand. Sam Walton is another example of a clearly a charismatic leader. And if you look at what these people, very different people had in common, was they were thinking big, they were acting boldly. Walton, when he died in 1992, just before he died, he was given the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and he said, we want to make it possible for people to have a better life, not only in America, but all over the world. Harlow Curtis wasn't saying that. Sam Walton was. And then, it's very interesting, actually, Walton died in 92. And in 94, Amazon was founded. And so the third phase of this book is 95 to the present. And I chose 95 on purpose. This wasn't an accident because in August of 1995, two very important things happened. One was Netscape had its IPO. And that everybody knew that that meant that the internet was real and important. And the second thing that happened that was important was that Microsoft launched Windows 95. And when you're an historian, you love it when they append the date. So you always, it's easy to remember, even when you're old like <laughs> I am and brain cells are dying, that Windows 95 was launched in 1995. So Ted, if you were to ask me, when did the War of 1812 begin? I could tell you, and I wouldn't say it was 1811 or 1813. So anyway, <laughs> it was these two things that happened. And since 1995, you can't walk out your front door without bumping into a charismatic business leader. And that's because lots of new things have been happening. The internet is a revolution. In 2007, when Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone, which he said, today Apple reinvents the phone. That's a big statement. The first phone call was made in 1876, but we're going to reinvent it. If you look at what Elon Musk, if you look at the model uh, three unveil, which was in 2016, he said, we're reinventing the car because that's going to save humanity. So they think big, they act big, they talk boldly, and sometimes they deliver. And those are the CEOs we're dealing with now. You used the word innovation before. And in that transition period, right, Lee Iacocca turned around a car company, but Sam Walton and Mary Kay Ash created new businesses. What is it about the time that's passed you know, since post-World War II that had this necessity for innovation and charismatic business leadership that may not have existed previously? There's a collection of essays called Does Technology Drive History? 
I'm not sure the answer is yes, but the fact is technology was changing very quickly. The computer had an impact on the world that people could only imagine back in the mid-1960s when the IBM 360 was uh, first introduced. So the computer made possible a whole bunch of innovations which people began to sense and were either going to grab for or not. Iacocca, in many ways, was a backward-looking CEO. I mean, he saved a company that there really wasn't any room for anyway. But other people began to look at the old way of doing things and realize that, you know what, this isn't working. Other countries are doing better. Look at Michael Milken, for heaven's sakes, for all his faults. He weaponized a whole new class of investment in junk bonds, which made possible the raids of the 1980s. And the raids of the 1980s also pushed change because you couldn't manage Robert Mercer, who was the CEO of Goodyear, when he was being raided by Sir James Goldsmith, couldn't manage that company the way Harlow Curtis managed General Motors in 1955 when raiding General Motors would have been utterly unthinkable. So the the market for corporate control is new. And the rearrangement of the stakeholders between either the workers and the managers and the shareholders and the customers became very powerful in the 1980s. My course was called The Coming of Managerial Capitalism, and my friends in finance at the Harvard Business School told me I should have called it The Going of Managerial Capitalism because (laughs) managers were being put on the back burner by investors. Well, that's a little bit of an overstatement. Management still matters, and it matters immensely. But investors have muscled their way to the table. There's no question about that. So it's probably not a stretch to say that success and charisma isn't necessarily inextricably linked. So I'm curious, what are the situations of when and why a company effectively requires a charismatic leader? It requires charismatic leader, in my opinion, in a crisis. I met with Jim Burke, who was the CEO of Johnson Johnson, when Tylenol was poisoned in the 1980s. And crisis turned him into a charismatic leader. So crisis can produce that, but also opportunity. When you see the BlackBerry, you remember the BlackBerry, I'm sure it was called the Crackberry. People were so attached to it. And you realize that it's actually kind of ugly and that Steve Jobs always believed that technology alone is not enough. The marriage of technology and the humanities lead to the results that make our hearts sing. And so he created the iPhone, which is beautiful. People thought, by the way, it was going to fail. Steve Ballmer, who was the CEO of Microsoft in 2007, thought it was going to fail because since it didn't have a plastic keyboard, it wouldn't be an effective email device. Well, he was wrong. Jobs was able to think different. And because of his success with the iPod and the iTunes store, no investors were upset with his thinking different. And there was a freedom that came from, I think, the moving of the center of gravity of innovation in the country from places like Dayton, Ohio. Think about Dayton, Ohio. It's where National Cash Register was headquartered when it was an innovative company. It's where the Wright brothers grew up first in flight. The center of gravity of American innovation has moved from the Middle West to California. And these are companies now that are innovating as much as they can as quickly as possible. So innovation is certainly one thing that one aspect. If you are a member of an out group, you want to muscle your way to the table. You've got to be Oprah Winfrey because the African-Americans who tried this on television prior to her failed because of racism. She herself said, I transcend race. These particular charismatic leaders, do you think this is innate to the individual? Is this sort of in a nature versus nurture question? Is it the person or people who require charisma in their roles able to become more charismatic? I think if they're not, you wind up with companies in trouble. Andy Grove was a very charismatic business leader, but his successors were not. And look at Intel today. So are charismatic leaders born or made? I think Steve Jobs was born. I don't think you can study to become Steve Jobs. I would say the same about Elon Musk. But that said, I do not believe that charisma is digital. I don't believe that you either have it or you don't. Because I've seen enough people be coached. I don't think there's a major executive in this country today that hasn't had media coaching. And I think that if you have media coaching 
and you are coached and you are conscious of the need to lead in an inspirational and aspirational way, you can have an element of charisma about you. So I think it can be learned if you understand its importance. What do you think these charismatic leaders do that others that lack charisma don't? First of all, they're courageous. Secondly, they have an idea of where they want to go. Thirdly, they're not imprisoned by the past. Robert Noyce, who was Intel employee number one, said, and Intel used to have this printed on t-shirts, don't be encumbered by history, go out and do something wonderful. And these are people who weren't encumbered by history. They were people who, who thought, not what can't I do, but what might be possible. The whole story of Gorilla Glass and the bringing of glass to the phone. Wendell Weeks, who was running Corning, which had been making glass since 1851, told Steve Jobs he couldn't get it. And Steve Jobs worked with Wendell Weeks long enough so that he wound up with glass on that phone. They walk through walls. They do things other people thought were impossible. Some of these leaders that you talked about, you could, a little bit of Steve Jobs and certainly Elon Musk, there's another side to them that you hear about. You hear about how difficult of a person Jobs was. There are a lot of skeptics of Elon Musk and his audacious aspirations. How do you think about the prospects of a charismatic leader and what they need to do to be successful in the path from having the vision to making it happen? Well, the definition of, if you will, going back to our earlier conversation of charisma is if I go running down the street stark naked saying that I and I alone can save the world and there are like thousands of people running after me saying, yes, it's true, Richard can save the world, I'm charismatic. If I go running down the street naked and say I alone can save the world and there's nobody running after me, they're going to take a butterfly net and put me you know, in an insane asylum. So one thing that charismatic leaders have to have are followers. And the creation of followers, it's a mutual relationship, is very subtle, very difficult, and very segmented. Musk is a good example, and so is Jobs. Some people who are charismatic to X number of people are not charismatic to Y. Some people are bitten by the bug and others aren't. But basically, the charismatic leaders that I live in Silicon Valley, that I see around here, are people who make believers out of skeptics. That's what they've got to do. Whenever I think about an entrepreneur, whatever it is, who's trying to create a vision, there's always an element of fake it till you make it. And Elizabeth Holmes certainly had all kinds of charisma, as we know, but there was no there there behind it. Now, that's sort of a digital, that was a, a zero, and maybe Steve Jobs has been a one. But in most of that spectrum, you're somewhere in the middle trying to create what will become the one. What happens as a charismatic leader works their way through just having a vision and having followers to either creating the product that does change the world, change a market, capture market share, or doesn't? Well, first of all, let's talk for a moment about Elizabeth Holmes. She's a perfect illustration of the fact that charisma is dangerous. Fake it till you make it is a saying out here, and I guess all over the world now. But she was faking it forever because that product never could have worked. There was a physician at UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, who when told about the Edison machine and the tiny little blood draw that you got from prick of a finger that was going to enable you to do X number of blood tests, said, I would be less surprised if these people told me they were time travelers who had come back from the 25th century than that if this device could ever actually work. So she was faking it, but she would never make it because that device never would have worked. Other companies, Microsoft is famous for vaporware in the early years, I should say, and certainly not now, marketing products that had not gone through the formality of being created. You have to really believe that you're going to be able to make it. And uh, I guess Elizabeth Holmes made a believer out of herself. She made a believer out of an, a lot of investors but there was no way in the world that thing was ever going to work. That was like Bernie Madoff saying, fake it till you make it. I mean, you, you fake it until you can't fake it anymore. That was her problem. But otherwise, there's a constant battle in tech companies, certainly technology companies, between product and schedule. 
And that's a little bit about, you've got to make believers out of people that it's going to be there even if it's late. I'm curious as we look out from here, there's so much buzz now about, say, blockchain technologies, Web 3.0, and decentralized organizations, which feels like it it's a potential shift away from the necessity of the charismatic leader. And I'm curious, you've been sitting in and around Apple and Silicon Valley for a while. What are you seeing in terms of where charisma will take us from here? Well, first of all, let me say that I'm a mere historian. That's all I ever claim to be. So I am very bad at predicting the future. I'm very good at predicting the past. <laughs> you know, as I told you, the, the War of 1812 started in 1812. I'm right again. One of the advantages is you're never wrong. I think that the need for charisma is actually going to increase, not decrease, and here's why. The people who are going to create whatever it is that's coming down the pike are going to be knowledge workers, and they're going to have to be really smart. If you look at the people who I've had the pleasure and privilege of working with and just interacting with, these people, they're just unbelievably brilliant. Think about the camera in a phone. And think about what it means to mass produce a camera and a phone. And so I had the pleasure when I was at Apple of interacting with the hardware and the software people who did that camera. These people are as smart as anybody anywhere. And so I think that for them to follow a leader, a Steve Jobs, you've got to have charisma. I don't see it diminishing. As a matter of fact, if I may, let's switch to politics just for a split second. There's no question that Trump, for a segment of the population, is a charismatic figure. And Biden, who is someone I frankly admire as a human being, is not a charismatic figure. And he's paying the price for that now. It's hard for him to sell what he needs to sell. It's hard for him to keep his poll numbers up because he's no Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt is the essence of a charismatic leader because his was the charisma of hope. I will tell you something that you will remember, which is that in 1933, when he gave his first inaugural address, he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. That's a charismatic statement. Adolf Hitler was an example of the charisma of hate. So it's got a lot of sides to it. But what it really does is it encourages you to park your reason and say, I'm going to bet on this person. That's dangerous. And I don't think it's going to go away. If someone was leading an organization and wanting to become more charismatic, what have you learned in the process of studying these charismatic leaders about how someone could go about doing that? First of all, don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to push. Don't be afraid to dream and dream big dreams. Moreover, be bold. Because if you're not going to be bold in your industry or in your company, whatever, somebody else is going to be because that's the world we're living in now. And I also think that what Sam Walton said is true. You can learn from anybody. So learn, keep learning, and ask yourself, what are my strengths and weaknesses? What can I build on to make myself more effective as an actor or actress in this world? By the same token, where am I weak? And so where can I find a partner who can shore up the weak part of me and make me more effective. By the way, there's an article in the Harvard Business Review in 2010 about how to be charismatic. Look at that. There are plenty of people willing to give you advice, but it takes a certain courage. In the immortal words of my father, it's very cold out there. And if your courage leads you astray, you'll wind up running People Express, which to the best of my knowledge doesn't run anymore. But that was the product of a dream. Sometimes dreams don't come true. Really, in a certain sense, you've got to figure out what kind of life do I want to lead? What kind of person do I want to be? Jobs was a special person. He gave the 2005 Stanford University commencement speech. The last time I looked on YouTube, it had been viewed by well over 35 million people. And let me tell you something, I, having spent most of my life in universities, giving a commencement speech that anybody is going to remember for 10 seconds, they're all the same. Set your goals high, but not beyond your reach. End of speech. He had something to say that the world wanted to hear. And that's one reason that those flowers wound up in front of those stores when he died on October 5th, 2011. What are some of your favorite stories 
of the charismatic leaders you studied in the book? I guess one, certainly I go back to Jobs, is the story of what it meant to make a presentation to Jobs in the old Apple campus. They've now moved to something called iSpaceship, but in what used to be called Infinite Loop. You would make a presentation to him in a room ridiculously misnamed Diplomacy, and you had to figure out, how do I do this? And that story is told by a guy named Ken Kosienda, who wrote a wonderful book called Creative Selection. I love that story because that really shows you how the sausage is made better than any other book I've read about Apple, and I've read a lot of them. Certainly, the biography of Oprah Winfrey, how she rose from a childhood which was unspeakably awful. I mean, this is a woman who, between the ages of 9 and 15, was raped repeatedly by, quote, family friends and, quote, relatives, and somehow managed to create herself and to become the queen of all media and to become the first female African-American billionaire. This didn't happen by accident. It happened because she's a charismatic person. And to me, these stories are inspiring and they show that aspirations can be realized. That's a nice thought to have in one's head. We have this strong interest in the current economic environment in a little bit of a more holistic approach to the purpose of business. So shareholder capitalism matters, but maybe isn't the only thing anymore. The environment's important. Social interests are important. Do you think the nature of a charismatic leader will shift as a result of that? That's what they're saying. Now let's watch what they do. But Satya Nadella, who's the CEO of Microsoft and who is a very interesting individual, has said that we have to be involved in this because if we're not, the future is very much in peril. And I think that, especially with a political system seemingly as dysfunctional as it, as it seems to be, business leaders are going to have to step up and broaden their own definition of charisma. These people are globally known. Everybody in the world knows who Jeff Bezos is. They've got to broaden their definition of charisma. And my hope is that they stop competing for the America's Cup and they stop shooting rockets in the air and they realize that we've got to make planet Earth work or we're all going to be in trouble. And my hope is that that's where they turn their attention and you and I are going to find out together. So Richard, what's next for you? I'm working on Ted Turner and I'm reading about him. And the reason for that is the chief of psychiatry at the Massachusetts General Hospital who's also a chair professor at the Harvard Medical School, a man named Maurizio Fava, wants to co-author with me a book about how the emotional issues that are faced by everybody, but that are extreme in some cases, and Turner is a very good example of that, can actually help someone, if managed correctly, be a success. This may turn into a small course at the Harvard Business School, and it may turn into a book. So that's what looks like it's what's next for me, Ted. Great, Richard. Before I let you go, I want to ask you a few closing questions. What is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? I try at the age of 74 to maintain my physical condition. So I walk a lot. I go to the gym a lot. And that's what I would say is my favorite hobby. What's your most important daily habit? Boy, that is an interesting question. I would say walking five miles a day. So I'm building on what I said before. That sets me up for the day. I get up, I walk five miles a day. I've done something. So if I make a mess of the rest of the day, at least I can say something at this age and stage. What's your biggest pet peeve? I loathe telephone menus. And if I were king of the universe, if I were a charismatic person, I would outlaw them. And the reason for that is when you call a hospital or a doctor's office or a drugstore or anything, you always get a menu and the menu never has on it what you want. And so that is my number one pet peeve. Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? That actually is not hard to answer. One is a man that I mentioned before, Alfred D. Chandler Jr., who basically created the modern field of business history. Uh, he and I wrote a textbook together. 
And he was just a wonderful, wonderful man. And the second was Tom McCraw. Both of these are Pulitzer Prize winning historians. Tom was, in addition to being a fine historian, he was very good politically. And at the Harvard Business School, that's really important. When you are untenured, and you know, I went there as an untenured professor, the worm that walks like a man, you don't know what's going on because everything is confidential. People are talking about you and they're talking about whether you're going to have a career or not. So you need advice. And Tom was a wonderful career manager for me. So Tom McCraw and Al Chandler are the two that I would mention. Now, recognizing that your career has been based on perfect historical information, what's the biggest mistake that you've made and what did you learn from it? The smartest thing I ever did was not shorting Tesla, but I've made some mistakes in classes. The most important thing you can do in a class, either at Apple or at Harvard or anywhere else, is to listen. And the biggest mistake was that there are times when I didn't listen as actively and as carefully to students as I should have. And as a result, I didn't pay them the respect they deserved. So if I had my life to do over again, I can think of a couple of examples of that that stick with me because I, if I've had any successes, I, I can't remember them, but I believe you me, I live through every mistake every day. So I'm sorry about those. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? Certainly my father's observations about business have stayed with me, that it's a tough world. You have to understand that. My mother was something of a polymath, spoke four languages, and was a very cultured woman. And it was really she who got me interested in opera. And my parents were on the board of the Metropolitan Opera in New York City for a while. So getting me involved and interested in the world of classical music and of opera, that was a gift that stayed with me my whole life. All right, Richard, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? Life is tougher than you think. That's the life lesson that I've learned. And I wish I knew it sooner, but I'm learning it now. So better late than never, I guess. Well, Richard, thanks again so much. It is wonderful to have this excuse to chat, to catch up and hear some about your most recent book. Well, thank you very much for having me on, Ted. It's delightful to talk to you and pure joy. Thank you so very much indeed. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show and I thank you for it. Have a good one and see you next time. An important disclaimer from Janice Henderson Group, PLC. Investing involves risk, including the possible loss of principal and fluctuation of value.